Wonderful. Great. Well, welcome to our fourth Conversations of Hope. It's great to be with you all. So let me give the introduction. This is something new we've started in 2021. We thought it would be an engaging and personal way for all of the Hope family to be able to come together. You know, our staff working with all of the people that are unhoused, that we help in a variety of different ways, our staff know what's happening day in and day out at Hope better than anybody else for a lot of reasons, not only because it's their role to work with those we serve day in and day out, but also because they are engaging the inherent issues that happen in our community around the people we're serving and around all of the availability to resources, especially having to do with housing. So I was thinking it'd be a wonderful way to have these monthly conversations to let our staff be known by all of you and also to give them a chance to share their insight into questions that relate to their areas of responsibility. So we have a very traditional and easy format with this conversation of hope. We meet at noon for free, the third Thursday of every month. Each month I try to bring on someone different. This month we have Andy and I'll do an intro for him in just a second. And this is part of a, a larger initiative with hope called Club Hope. Club Hope is a program that honors our recurring monthly donors, donors that give as little as $1 or $2 a month recurring. It's a way that we can honor them in a special way and it's a way we can lean into that recurring donation to support our wide variety of programs. So it's, it's a fantastic way to be involved in our, I'm gonna stop everyone's video. Oh, hi everybody. Just taking everybody off video and muting for the first part of this. And then I'll give you a chance to, let's see. Great, okay. So it's, it's put together by Club Hope. And this is an initiative we started in 2021 that gives an opportunity for those that wish to, to be recurring donors and in that receive a lot of other perks and incentives and ways to grow deeper as part of the Hope family. Regardless of whether you're part of the program or not of Club Hope, we offer these conversations of hope for free to everyone, whether you are part of the Hope volunteer system, whether you're part of our benefactors, whether you're part of our staff, whether you're part of the participant, a part of our programs, everyone is invited to attend Conversations of Hope. And even in the larger arena, we publicize this in local publications, in our blog, in our social media posts, and in our newsletters. And we share it with our community partners as well. They share it through all their channels. So it's a great way to learn the pulse of what's happening here at, at Hope. And as you well know, I have Andy who's joining us this month to share his experience, his insights, and his wisdom. We'll start off, I'm gonna pin him so that he's front and center even when I pose questions. We're gonna start off the beginning of this meeting with six questions that are come to me oftentimes in relation to Andy's area of responsibility. And he is in charge of all of our volunteers and all of our street outreach. And as many of you know, when we started very small with just a handful of individuals don donating their time, we were street outreach. We were going out there providing resources to those we met on the streets. Andy is the hub, the force, and the continuation of that integral program to Hope and its mission. So welcome, Andy. Great to have you. People are jumping on left and right. I will continue to welcome people in. And so if I cross over when you're talking, it's only because... I absolutely have to in letting somebody in. So welcome, Andy, great to have you. 
Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for putting this together and welcome. I see the participant number just kind of growing and growing. So yay. <laughs> so um, I have six questions that come to me a lot in relation to what you do and in relation to our staff in general. So I'm just going to run down that list. And the first question that comes oftentimes is, why are you working with those suffering homelessness? What's part of your personal story and ideology uh, related to our mission? Wow. Um, so I, it's just, it's something that I've been doing now for about 30 years. Um, homelessness has just been something as far back as I can remember is something, I don't think fascinated is the right word, but something that I was interested in. Um, you know, in college, I studied a little bit about it in some of my classes. And then after graduation, you know, I started my career, um, which is very different than this one. We won't go down that road. <laughs> but um, I started working for a homeless organization. Um, it was one of the first um, real, you know, post-college volunteer opportunities that I did. And I had been volunteering for homeless organizations throughout my entire adult life. Um, and then as things changed and went through life changes, um, we moved out to Colorado from North New Jersey. And I ended up um, through a course of meeting different people working here at Hope. Um, I was volunteering at the Our Center, another organization here, which turned into a job. And I, I just really connected with the homeless community that was coming through the Our Center at the time. Um, and then when a job opportunity opened up here at Hope, uh, I applied and ended up in the role that I think I was meant to be in. Um, I, I, it's, it's really, it's a very gratifying role for me to, to, to be doing. Um, I, I like working with our clientele. They're all so fascinating, um, so resilient. There's just, it's been a, um, a very life-changing opportunity for me, even though I've been doing this in a sense for 30 years. Mm, thank you so much. What, what's like one story since you've been a part of Hope that was an interaction with somebody we serve that was inspiring for you? Oh, there's been so many. Oh, um, I can tell, talk about a recent one. There are, there's just so many. Sure. So I, I got a Facebook message probably three weeks ago from somebody I met probably about two and a half, three years ago. Uh, he was living in his car and we talked about sobriety and, you know, moving forward. And we probably met a few times and I got a message from him a few weeks ago. Um, basically, he went through rehab. He came out of rehab. He's been clean and sober. He now he has a house again. Um, he's reunited with his kids. He's working. So, you know, we were able to just through conversation, get somebody back on their feet um, and, and back to a, a normalized life. One you know, with family connection, community connection, and continually moving forward. Mm, thank you. A, a lot of those, you know, we refer people to agencies and they do come back with their gratitude and their stories. Um, we have some volunteers that used to be clients. We have staff that used to be clients. So um, it, it's really, that's the most gratifying to me is just to have people see their lives change and move forward because of the work we do here. Yeah, well, one of the things I really appreciate on a collegial level of working with you, Andy, is your availability to people. I mean, it's an it's a intelligent and emotional availability that oftentimes the people we work with don't get a chance to have in their lives with the people around them. And so I really, really appreciate that gift you bring to oh, the people we serve, yeah. So well, they're so, really amazing people, you know, once you yeah. get to know them. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And well put. So how is street outreach going these days? And what are some of the ways it's changed during the pandemic? Um, so it's changed a lot during the pandemic. Um, especially, well, there's so many angles to this question. Um, so I'll start with the volunteer side of it. So one of the challenges has been with COVID, we had a lot of our regulars, um, you know, stop doing street outreach because of the pandemic, which is completely expected. There's, it's not, you know, we're not upset, disappointed, mad. It's just 
people had concerns and right concerns with that. Um, on the outreach side, at the beginning of the pandemic, food scarcity was a real big problem. We started immediately bringing a lot more food out into the streets. Um, a lot of our clients, they would get money for food um, from flying signs or panhandling, but there was nobody out for them to panhandle because everybody was quarantined. Um, we also saw a lot of restaurants close and a lot of the restaurants in our community would help and give food out to the people that were you know, living outside or coming by the restaurants by the back door. So that came to a halt as well. So food scarcity at the beginning of this, probably about a year ago, was real extreme. So we, we increased the amount of time we were spending out in the streets and increased the amount of food that we provided. I, I'm sure you remember this. We also, mm -hmm. that's when we opened up our day shelter yeah. and started um, you know, working with other organizations to bring food in to help feed people at our day shelter. Um, at this point where we are now, food scarcity is not the biggest issue. And, you know, extreme weather, I mean, we're going to get some snow tonight, so we'll be taking care of folks. One of the shifts this year, which is a good shift, in, in my opinion, is we're seeing fewer people when the weather gets bad. People are getting much more, they're getting better at self-resolving their situations and finding places to stay, um, whether it's with family members who they normally can't stay with or with friends. What we've seen sort of their little, you know, each person's community gather around them during COVID, um, which is really inspiring. You know, we're seeing some people get back together with their families and rebuild some of those relationships. So I, not saying COVID is a good thing, but we are seeing a little bit of silver linings out of the things that we've been through over the last, over the last year. Yeah, that's well put. When, when a collective stress happens, oftentimes connections can be refreshed family yeah. connections can be refreshed friendships can be refreshed and they can find new meaning and new support yeah. Yeah. so going forward over the summer you know i'm starting to think about some different ideas we are seeing some more there's a lot of people doing street outreach here in long right now which we'll touch on a little bit later um, so we'll see how this morphs over the next few months i've got some thoughts we may um Maybe start doing some more daytime outreach. Um, I'm not sure yet. Um, but I think as this pandemic sort of starts to push to the side, we may have more people interested in doing street outreach. So we'll have to look at how to get people involved. We, I love to get people involved. So, um, <laughs> Hence why you're the volunteer outreach coordinator. <laughs> Great volunteer opportunity to keep volunteers active. <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome <laughs> um so there's a lot of interest in bolstering street outreach as a way to reach those in need of services and where you've seen in our organization has seen a collective of of both funding and new agencies coming into the longmont community and um, I have been thrilled to see that you've kind of taken the helm of drawing these agencies together, but I think maybe not everybody knows about what's happening. Yeah. What's happening on the street outreach collective agency effort? So it's been really great. Um, you know, there's been a lot of money coming into helping homelessness over the last year. And that's led to more agencies wanting to come into Longmont and do street outreach. And I, I think... One of the nice things is all of us are coming in, into it with a little bit of a different strength. We have, just to give some examples, there's an agency here, our Veterans Community Project, and they work with strictly with, with vets, but they're not tied to the VA. Pretty sure about that, um, that they're not tied. But that, so we're able to, if we have come across some vets that need services, um, we can connect with them. We are working with Boulder County Health for people that have substance abuse problems. We are working with, um, who else we're we working with? There's a new team coming in doing street outreach and they're bringing a clinician as well as peer counselors. So we're all working together and bringing different strengths. So with all these people, different organizations coming in, I thought it was important that we sort of know what, A, first of all, know who each other is 
and what the strengths are of each of these organizations, but also make sure that we're not all out there at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it would be very overwhelming for our clients to have people coming up to them multiple times every day. Um, I, I had one volunteer who joked that they're going to start wearing no soliciting signs. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was really kind of funny. <laughs> um, totally. So we're going to we're working together to sort of bring more resources out to the people that need it and connect them to other agencies. I mean, really, it does. It all does come down to community. So now we have our own little community of outreach professionals that are out there. Um, and my goal here is, and it seems to be collective, that working together towards um, the end goal of getting people connected to services and housing should provide much better results than each of us working individually and, you know, and not communicating and working collectively. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. So for any of you that are looking to see what that means, Andy drew together all the agencies to form the collective. So the agencies were funded to come into the area of Longmont. And Andy said, well, we need to all sit down at table for all the reasons that he said. And, and I think even the potential for innovative solutions yeah. coming about from what you're doing, you know, who, who knows what can come forward in addition to the street outreach itself. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. So far, we've been just sort of working as a collective now. I think we're in our third week and we're already seeing some positive results. Um, a great example is one, a client of another organization um, got a housing voucher. So we were able to put out um, an APB, so to speak. And we were able to find this person much quicker and connect them to their housing voucher. Yeah, that's great. Can Is it okay to share some of the other agencies that are? Sure. Are, yeah. Uh, yeah, there were a lot, so I'll try to go through them. So one was the Veterans Community Project. Um, one is Boulder County Health, which runs um, or Boulder County AIDS Prevention, which runs the harm reduction. So they're the ones who will do the needle exchange program, the works program. Um, so we're connected with them. We're connected with L there, which is part of Together. So Together is an organization out of Boulder that works with homeless youth age 18, I think through 24. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's through 24. So, the, the, um, so we work close with them. We don't see a lot of youth, but they're the ones who have come into town with the peer counselor, the caseworker and the clinician. The great thing about having a clinician on the streets is a lot of our clients really need mental health care. And it's hard to connect them to mental health care, partially because um, a lot of just places are closed. So the only way they can do it by phone. And also it's hard to keep, it's hard for them to make appointments. You know, they have an appointment next Thursday at one o'clock. It's really difficult for them to keep track of days and times. So they know to show up Thursday at one o'clock. So with a clinician on the streets, we can kind of get people into mental health care without really knowing that they're receiving mental health care. That's great. Um, so we have a list of folks that we're going to really work on connecting um, the clinician with. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I know having the peer counselors, they bring a whole different perspective to it as well. I mean, they're people with lived experience. So that there's um, an element of trust that is instantly there. Yeah. We are also working while well, there's a lot of organizations. Oh, the Recovery Cafe here in Longmont. So they build community for people that are recovering from whatever it is they may be recovering from. It could be substance abuse, it could be a food issue. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It, everybody is recovering from something and they provide community for people to get support. Um, there's accountability with that program. So people need to show up and be accountable um, for, it could be washing the dishes um, and they have workshops that they need to take part in. It's a phenomenal organization. Um, COVID, I think, you know, put a little, like everybody made it a little difficult, but they're, they're expanding right now. So they're doing street outreach here in Longmont and we'll be yeah. collaborating with them on a regular basis. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's there's a lot of potential there for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing more yeah. about that. What, what would you like one to say? One more that I want to share. 
I, there's, I, I, cause I, I don't want to miss this. So we okay, are, all, of course. it's, it's such a great community. Um, and we're doing minimum street outreach, but there's an organization now that is doing work with homeless pets. And I think you right. featured her. So, um, we're going to have a clinic on April 24th, um, that we're helping promote where people can bring their homeless pets to this clinic and, there will be vets there to do shots and make appointments for spaying and neutering and you know the whole host of what you'd need for a pet but people that are living on the streets with their pets can't get so that's now becoming a part of street outreach as well um pet care right right is that annie and millie's place annie and millie's place right yeah great great well also as anything develops by way of marketing materials let me know yeah. Even though we're in contact, I would like to share more about her through social media. So Annie and Millie's Place is a new nonprofit. And if you've been following any of the newsletters, we did a spotlight on Kristen. And you, she shared her personal story around why she started that nonprofit. Because her own, her own sister passed away who was homeless and had a pet. And she decided that here was an opportunity just to start to change what was a tragedy into a victory. And yeah. that's where this nonprofit came from. So it's a very inspiring story. It's on our YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it, uh, take a look at it to know her better. And I have a little street outreach story related to that. So we Great. read somebody who, whose pet um, ended up at the Humane Society um, in a neighboring town, I don't want to throw it because I, I love I love the Humane Society, but they were hold. They basically told him he had to come up with the money to pay for the vet services, where they were going to have to put his his service animal up for adoption. Um, and he reached out to us. He was somebody we knew through street outreach, and we were able to connect with Annie and Millie's place, and she was able to raise the funds, so he and reunite him with his service animal. Yeah, thank you. Is, you know, th these are the little street outreach things that really, you know, make it all worthwhile. Right, right. Yeah, that's fantastic. As well as working collaboratively, collaboratively with these other organizations. Mm -hmm. We're just able to help a lot more people and get a lot more accomplished. Yeah, I meant to that. So if you could paint a picture of what you would like to see happen in street outreach in the next three to five years, especially now with these bolstering agencies, initiatives, funding, your own experience out on the streets, what would you like to see happen? Um, ideally, I'd like to be out of a job. No, I'm yes. no, 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 I know. We all want that. Right? <laughs> but, um, really. Independently wealthy. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, we have to close because there's no homeless people. I'm yep. the lottery. Yep. Um, but I, I think what's happening now with bringing these agencies together, um, I, I think that is really the way I'd like to see this continuing over the next few years as a, a large community collaborative effort. Um, I, I, I would like to be, mental health is such a big piece for people out there. I mean, I think outside of just a lack of real, you know, low income and affordable housing, the mental health piece is huge. Um, so many of our clients that are living outside have PTSD or bipolar. They have a whole long list of different mental health issues and getting clinicians out into the streets. Um, I, I think it's something that I, I'm going to be working on starting very soon as we come out of COVID is just building better relationships with mental health providers. So it's easier, it's much easier for our clients to access. And whether that is at an office, but more importantly, is getting them out and getting that out into the streets. I know our, our police department here in Longmont has their core team, which we we have used, and they bring you know a mental health um, crisis person out into the streets when needed. But it would be great if if that was a bigger piece of street outreach, of, mm -hmm. so addressing the mental health issues that are out there. Right. I know that's kind of the next step, right? Providing yeah. basic needs so that our fellow human beings can survive and can be healthy. And then the next step is providing for the healing and the support system on a mental level. Yeah. So that, um, yes. I didn't even consider that a basic need at this point, the mental health yeah. piece. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, so that's, um, 
that's I think the next thing that we'll really be focusing on here is really addressing the mental health issues that go out there, and that includes sobriety. Most people, you know, if people are are using substances, it's usually connected to some sort of trauma, or or self medication for a mental health issue. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And it all just stems from that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the the other fifty percent of your time, and we won't divide it black and white 50 50 <laughs> but uh, you you have the volunteer program what does it mean to you to be an anchor and coordinator of this integral program and we rely so heavily they, they're a huge part of our force and they largely go unseen many of our volunteers don't even get to meet each other because of the way the volunteer program works right. what does it mean to you and um I would love anything that you would share personally about how you feel in this role and any stories you might have about it. Well, it, it's it, it's almost the polar opposite of the other role. I kind of look at them as the yin and yang of each other. Mm. Um, but so we, we have roughly 350 active volunteers a month, which, you know, most people would never guess that it takes that many people to, uh, to do what we do. And that, that's expanded. Um, our volunteers mean everything to me and they know I try my best to communicate with all of them on a, as much as I can. Um, it's sometimes it's challenging. So I apologize to anybody if I did not get back to you in a timely manner. Um, I, I, being a volunteer, most of my life in one role or another coming up to this, it was a little bit overwhelming at first, but I just sort of brought in my own personal experiences as a volunteer, as the way like I wanted to be communicated with, the way I wanted to be treated. And I took that and I sort of want to do the same back out to the volunteers that we have. It, it's, it's not much different than, you know, dealing with street outreach and it, treat others as the way you want to be treated is, mm -hmm. I, I know there's been sometimes in organizations I've volunteered with, I was just kind of viewed as excess labor, not as something to be cherished, you know, to be appreciated. And um, so we do our best to really show our appreciation to volunteers. Once COVID's over, I'm hoping we can put an event together and some of our volunteers can all meet each other. I can meet some of the volunteers I haven't met yet. Um, I, I'm actually looking very forward to the day that we're able to do that again. Yes, me too, because I, I haven't even had a chance to experience it and get to meet the volunteers having come on right when COVID hit. So once you have it put together, I'm looking forward to being yeah. there and meeting everybody too. Yes, understood. And if you're a volunteer on the call, know that we still have desire to do volunteer spotlights. So many of you have been very shy about uh, letting me interview you, but I would love to celebrate your part as being part of the HOPE mission. So if you do have interest, email. And if you know people that would like to volunteer, Andy is always open and interested with bolstering the volunteer pool. You can email Andy at andy at hopeforlongmont.org. So, right, this is, a, this is an ever active part of the HOPE organization. Yeah. So, yeah, go Andy, what? Well, so our our, it, I think this leads, go ahead with your next question because I think it's gonna lead into what I was gonna and say. It, yeah, and this is the last question. So it has to do with that. What ways has the program changed? What ways has it stayed the same? What do you see or want to see with the volunteer program going forward? So I, I think it, right when I started here, it was on the precipice of change. So I came in at, at, at a pretty good transition moment. Um, our, one of our bigger volunteer programs is our Soup Angel program, which is our program for providing food for all of our clients every night. So that program used to be, we'd go out in the streets with little individual cups People knew where the hope truck was going to be and they'd show up and we'd be able to give them a little cup of soup and maybe a, a sandwich or something. Um, and so, soon before I start, right before I started, we started um, feeding people at our shelter instead of out on the streets so people could come to our shelter. And so we switched from little cups to more of a buffet style meal where we have people every day cook a meal for 10 people 
Um, they cook a main entree and a side dish and desserts. Um, so we get a nice variety of foods every night. Um, people, and so people are allergic or have an issue with a certain kind of food, there's always another one. But more importantly than that, they're able to sit together as a community and break bread at a table together instead of sitting on a curb with, with a styrofoam cup. And there's nothing wrong with the old program, but the way we switched was brings a lot more dignity um, to people and I, I think probably more nutrition. So that program has really grown tremendously since I got here. And on top of that, we had to then start bringing people in to serve that meal um, and clean up and help with that. So that was a new program. So we've had a lot of new programs added since I, I began. As you know, we started our Safe Lot program nine months ago, roughly. Um, so we needed to increase our food program there. Just uh, if you don't mind, I'll go into Safe Lot a little bit. Sure. Sure. So, I mean, it's a great program. Um, we were the first in Colorado to do this. So we have people that are, who are living in their vehicles have a safe place to park every night. Um, we do that on private property. Um, it's a, people have app apply and they're able to come in and get a hot meal and sit and support each other and get case management, have access to hot showers. Um, a lot of them are working people that just can't, couldn't get into a place to live. Um, so, and that program is expanding, is expanding. So our food program is continually expanding, um, which is how we're getting up to about 350 volunteers. Yeah, a month. I know it's fantastic. It's really, um, really great. Yeah, and so, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, so, and we're already, can you believe it? We're already at 1232. So usually this time in the conversations, we open it up for questions and comments. This is a chance for you to ask something of our staff member that you've, you've always been one, you've always wanted to know. And since we're just at 35 participants, which is a manageable size, I would invite you to come off mute and off your video just to share your question and then go back on mute and video and and um, try to keep it concise so we can take as many as possible. And I, I will, as I see you go off, um, I will pin you so you can ask your question and everybody can see your face. So it looks like Julia went off first. Oh no, you don't want to? Sorry. <laughs> well, I, was just, I, I didn't know if we were, yeah, but. Okay, you, let's see. Um, if you went off mute, I'm going to assume you have a question or a comment. And so I am going to try to get you pinned. I'm going to, I'm going to, isn't that funny, Julia? Now you're stuck. I'm stuck. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> okay. I should Let's think of a question. So, no. so if you're on mute, but didn't go off your camera, I can't pin you. So Brigitte or George, do you have a question or a comment? And maybe Brigitte, if you want to go first, or Bridget, Bridget Johnson. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I work for Hope, and uh, I do the shelters, and uh, love it. Um, I have seen a lot of people um, getting housing, and it's just like they'll talk about it. Go, well, yeah, you know, up for housing, and then next thing you know, in a few weeks, they, they got their housing, and and the looks on their face, and how excited they are to, you know, have this opportunity um, gives me great joy. It, um, you know, we've had a lot of clients that uh, that have been on the on the streets for a very long time, or had an injury and trying to get around on a wheelchair, and you know, down the street because they have an injury. So, well, they're getting housed, and it's just a, an amazing. Um, it's amazing. I get, when it happens, I just get, my heart just fills up and it's smiling and, and hope has done if, even for myself, because I was a client at one time, um, is an amazing organization. And just the people that work there are angels. They're all angels. And I just, I just wanted to uh, express that. And uh, I'm really proud to be part of the HOPE 
family. Uh, thank you, Bridget. We're happy. We love having you as part of our Hope family. And, and the housing part, if I may, is really great. Everybody should have the opportunity at some point to go and move somebody into their home after they're being after their homeless experience. Um, that is, it's really, it's something special. Yeah, yep. it is. Bridget, thank you so much for that share. We're really- Well, thank you. And your words, absolutely. So we've got George, then Lori, then Becky. So George, you're off mute. Did you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, uh, my name is George. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, for for uh, for everybody's uh, good work at Hope is so impressive. I get the emails periodically. My wife and I have made some donations, and uh, we have a daughter that's on the street. Uh, my question has to do with uh, with your office manager uh, situation. I had an issue with that. I want to know how who I should contact to provide that information. I, I don't want to bring it up here and complain at the meeting here, but I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to uh, contact somebody and let them know uh, the issue I had in that situation. Oh, sure. Well, Joseph's our executive director. You could email him directly, joseph at hopeforlongmont.org. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for reaching out and being willing to share your experience. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Lori, Lori, you're next. Hi, I want to say thank you to both of you and the whole team for all that you do. It's very exciting and so great to see um, that needs are being met. I, my question is about the shelter program that you're running. Um, how many people do you house? Um, are you able to house? And do you think that you're able to meet the demand or how many people do you have to turn away? Right, and you've asked it, what sounds like a simple question is actually a pretty <laughs> complex question. <laughs> um, Andy can probably speak to it generally. We do have reports with numbers and things like that, but Andy, do you wanna to speak to the, the general? Uh, well, I haven't, I, I can talk better about last year than I can about this year, as far as number of people housed, um, just because I, I am more familiar with those numbers and I haven't really been tracking this year very closely. Um, or, so I think last year, if I remember correctly, we were able to get roughly 60 people housed and another program we have is a reunif reunification program where we're able to get people reunited with their families um, from wherever their families originally came from, which is, so we don't just send people back. We make sure we get in touch with their families and make sure they're welcome back to where they're going and have a support network. So all in all last year, I think we did got a hundred and roughly 115 people off the streets and into housing or back reunited with their families. I'm not That's sure. That's huge. Mm hmm. So when you say shelter, um, do you mean like there is a physical location that they can go in for the night? Yes. Or and then how many beds do you have in that shelter? And is it male and female? Yes. So we have we're allowed to accept up to 49 people each night. Um, we do allow male and female, but they have to be over the age of 18. We do, we're not really equipped to shelter minors. It's a much more complicated issue um, with bringing in minors. It is a, we thought it was a big gap, but it, this year we're finding out it's probably a smaller gap than we initially thought, um, gap in services. So, but when we don't let people cohabitate, so we have a separate room at each shelter for our female clients and, and our male clients. So they are able to eat together and spend time together. But even if couples are married, we do not let them stay together. It just, it creates a whole different set of problems um, to have cohabitation. <clears throat> uh, and each night, it, it really varies like tonight, it depends, we'll see how the weather goes, but we could have 35, 40 people 
Um, when we had the big snowstorm last month and the cold snap, we were pretty close to capacity every night, if not at capacity. So it's not every night that you're at capacity no. throughout the year. Okay. Right. And it's like this year's been a little different. Usually in the past, we were past years in very cold weather um, and snow. We, we did unfortunately have to turn people away. Um, if we do turn people away, I mean, we're making sure they have sleeping bags, coats, you know, everything they would need to survive a night. Um, unfortunately, you know, that's just, it's one of the, uh, the sad pieces of this business is that sometimes we are just full. Um, this year, people have been really resource, resourceful, as I, I talked about earlier, about finding places to stay when we've been hit with really bad weather. Um, so we're grateful for that. Yeah. Right. We're grateful for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And while you both were, were speaking, I pulled up last year's report and uh, at the nighttime alone. So remember we opened day shelter as Andy referred to in response to COVID and our safe lot program opened, but nighttime shelter alone served more than 20,000 hot meals. We helped 355 people and uh, some were return visits, some were maybe one-time helps, but even those that knocked on our door outside the nighttime shelter we gave out more than 3,000 meals and we gave out about, looks like close to 4,000 other types of um, material needs, you know, socks and sleeping bags and hygiene items. And we had over 7,000 hours of volunteer help that helped us put that together. Also our bike program, we gave out 25 bikes last year so when somebody has a job and needs transportation, but maybe can't have a car or doesn't have a car, uh, we have a bike program that takes on old bikes donated and refurbishes them and provides transportation. So those are a few numbers to, to add to what Andy shared. And um, I could certainly, if you emailed me, give you numbers for this year too. So just as in the den of that, we were talking about other services um, the bus system in Longmont is fantastic with it. We have free bus service here, but it's mostly a north-south bus system. There's not a lot of east-west and especially connectivity to other towns. Um, right now, I'm on a council with, um, I guess, a, 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 an advisory board for transportation. And that's one of the pieces we'll be focusing on is trying to increase east-west um, transportation services and um, making it maybe easier for our low income and disability clients to get between here and other towns for, for work, for doctor's appointments, for whatever their needs are. So that's sort of a, a community gap that um, I am very excited we were invited to join that advisory council. So we'll be working over the next five months on seeing if we can increase those services. Right, and, and thank you, Andy. And I'm, I'm guessing since many of you are already lovers of hope, but I wanna to add to what Andy is giving witness to. And I think he is giving a great eloquent witness to the fact that we work so intimately with each person. You know, we really care about each person and we're this force of mediation between, or yes, between the relationship of the person and the local community. And there are a wide variety of reasons that that relationship doesn't work or is fragmented or is in need of an organization like ours. But Andy is giving great examples as to the comprehensive and personal way that we work with everyone. I think that that speaks volumes. We don't look at people like a cookie cutter that they have to fit into a box. We come to them. So, yeah. <laughs> so I see El Evelyn is off mute. Evelyn, did you have a question or a comment? I do. Um, okay, you say um, in the shelter you can have 49, up to 49 people, sometimes a little more. Um, why, what are some of the reasons why you have to turn people away? Once we hit the number 49? Yes. Okay. Um, it's, we're not, I, wow. 
this was a much better question to give to our shelter director who, Alice, um, yeah. who I think will be on next month. So <laughs> she is on next month. So bring that. Yeah. But Andy can give a great answer, but come, come again next month for Alice. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> I'll do the best I can with that. I do believe it has to do some of it with, with some fire code and, and, and regional coding that we've agreed to with the city. Um, I, I, Take me at 90% 90, 90 on that answer. Um, so some of that is dictated by regulates, you know, outside regulations. Um, and I, I, I don't know what else to say because I'm not sure of the, the greater detail on that, but I believe that's part of our contract. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yes, go ahead, Evelyn. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, when COVID hit, we had to. Uh, oh, Bridget. Yeah. Uh, have the space, you know, you know, the six feet, six feet spacing, and so we had to be really careful about that. And that was one of the reasons why we would have to turn somebody away because we were at we were at capacity with the COVID regulations. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, thank um, you, Bridget. Yeah. That actually, yeah, that is a, a very important piece. Thank you for that insight. No worry. Mm -hmm. Very good. Wow. So, and yeah. Becky, it looks like you got your question answered with some of those stats. But if you had something more, let us know. And so, so many of these questions are coming from our volunteers that um, contribute so much. It's really uh, happy <laughs> to see them on here. <laughs> Yay, volunteers. Big shout out to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, so Kristen, did you have a question? You're off mute. Yes, I do have a well, a comment and a question. Number one, I'm Kristen from Annie and Millie's Place, and I uh, just want to give a shout out back to you all for your collaborative nature and the way that you not only look for the services that you can provide, but the way that you look at partnering organizations and find ways to make like the complete puzzle uh, together. And in doing that, each organization is helped to do their work better. So you have led the way in that. And I appreciate being invited into that partnership. And um, you guys are just, you are, I think you're a model of the way that community work should be happening. So thank you for your support and for doing that kind of work. It's outstanding. Um, I do have a question kind of in line with uh, how the sheltering runs. And I've sort of wondered this in the past, maybe a better or question for next month. What do you do or how do you serve those who, I, who don't identify as either male or female or somewhere on the gender non-binary track? Is there a or track or um, space? Would there be a way to accommodate their needs as well here in Longmont? So we don't turn anybody away based on sexual identity. Um, it, it's not even a question we ask. Um, but if you're putting them in a room of male and female, then how do you? I think. Let, do you, you let know, them say? God, I was part of a small discussion on. Uh, I'm going to defer for somebody else to answer that because I don't want to answer it wrong. Sure, sure. Right. And that's, um, yeah, and Alice will be able to speak to that next month a little bit better. I'm pretty sure we also ask for their preference. Okay. You know, we have a conversation mm -hmm. with them and, and make that choice based on their comfort. Yeah, Michael, thank you for your quick comment. It's duly noted. Yes. I appreciate your intention so much to honor each person individually. And I've seen you do that. And um, so I was curious how that worked out um, structurally in a framework like sheltering. How do you um, how do you do that? So thank you for your intentionality and paying attention to uh, all of the needs and being so welcoming. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. So we've got a couple people still off mute, which you may just be off mute because you asked something before. But if uh, Evelyn, if you had another question or comment, please go I, ahead. I do. Uh, it's not for Andy though. It's mainly for the for the homeless pet clinic. Um, Andy and Millie's place. Um, do you 
also take care of pets that like our clients of maybe of the Hour Center? And are you part of the Hour Center Pet Clinic? Or is that entirely two different programs? And Kristen, if you want to put your email and your contact info in the chat box, that would be great. And uh, if it's a, a longer answer, maybe the two of you can talk outside of our meeting today. I honestly, I caught half of that question. It was kind of breaking up a little bit. Um, can you reframe or restate that question? Okay. Uh, I know the Hour Center has a pet clinic that they do, I think, once a month. Are you associated with that program too, or, or, or is it two different programs? We are a separate organization um, working as best we can following the model that Andy's putting out with HOPE to help organizations that are already doing some of this work to enable them to do better or more or um, expand it a bit. Coming at... Uh, folks are experiencing homelessness who have pets. My sister was one. So what I bring to this table is uh, that of a family member of somebody who's experiencing homelessness and some of my own story of understanding um, what that's like and trying to build more support to help the organizations that are already doing this work really well. So that's in offering the clinic for, um, for pets at the end of this month, that was connecting with, yes, I am in conversation with the R Center and with Hope to reach folks um, to provide them with services provided by the Street Dog Coalition out of Fort Collins. So we're not actually providing the service as much as we are connecting organizations and continuing or starting to and continuing to build resources to help those organizations do even more of what they're already doing really well. Does that answer your question? It does, it answers a lot. And I did get your email, so I can try to email you and hope you can answer. Uh, For sure, I'll stick questions. my website up there as well. Okay, thank you. Oh, that, fantastic, that's great. Well, we're, we're getting close to the end of our hour. Does anybody have any final questions or comments for Andy? And if not, I'll turn the platform back to him to give his, his official closing uh, remarks. Do you have your closing remarks? <laughs> great. So Andy, what would so you- I just wanted to say something real quick. Absolutely. I am, this is Bridget. I, I am so proud and so happy to be a part of the um, Hope family. Um, it's not, for me, it's not just a job. It is, I mean, I, I, I am so proud to work for, for Hope and they're great people. And I just wanted to put that out there that I am proud to be a part of this organization. Well, Bridget, we're happy to have you as part of our organization as well. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> And I feel, the, I feel the same way as you, Bridget. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Kimberly. Yeah. All right, you guess what? This is my first Zoom. I'm pretty proud that I was able to do it. <laughs> Yay, victory! Yay, I know, that's huge for me, man. <laughs> that's awesome. So I know, right? I'm like... <laughs> so before we close out, just a reminder that we have this Conversations of Hope every month on the third Thursday of the month at noon, it's always for free. If anything ever happens like this glitch that happened with our registration platform, you can always email me directly, Kimberly at hopeforlongmont.org. You can trust that the morning of you will get the Zoom link, if not before. So uh, you can always trust you can be a part of it. And we will always have a different staff member. Obviously at a certain point, we'll be repeating staff members, but with our growing staff to 29, I think we've got quite a pool to move through before we start getting to repeats. Second to that, this is part of the larger program called Club Hope. And that program is a recurring donation program. If you feel at all inspired or able 
to even commit to a small monthly donation to support our programming. We rely heavily upon our donations, our volunteers and our donation, donation of time, talent, and treasure, we completely rely upon. That's how we pay amazing staff like Andy. That's how we expand to meet the needs of our clients and our participants. And so if you have any inspiration, just know do no donation is too small. I know I'm probably like you that it can feel overwhelming to give a monthly donation, but knowing that no donation is so small makes it a lot easier. So if you feel inspired or if you need more info, email me as well. Stay tuned for more free events and I'm gonna hand it back to you, Andy. What, what would you like to close with? Uh, well, first let me thank you know, all the volunteers on here and not on mm -hmm. here. We couldn't do any of the work we do without you. They really are an amazing group. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you've seen it. We put a request out for help with anything and we get, it's almost an overwhelming response back. Sometimes we hesitate asking for help because we know the response is just gonna be much larger than we expect. Um, so it's a testament to the people that are connected with us. It really, it's pretty special. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and just, uh, piggybacking on what Bridget said, everybody that I know that works for Hope, it, isn't here for a paycheck because it's a job. They're all here because they care. Um, it, it's an amazing group of people to work with. It's it's really, it makes it easy to come in every day. Mm -hmm. It sure does. I look forward to going to work. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of people that can say that. <laughs> yeah, it's a great organization. I'm proud to be part of it. Yeah. No. and. Everything we do comes back to community on one level or another. We, we have such an amazing community here, uh, both with eight partner agencies, volunteers, staff, even our clients. I mean, it's really, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing that we have going on here. I'm very proud yeah. and humble to be part of it. Amen yep. to that. So in the yeah. chat box, I also put the link for all the different ways you can be involved, whether it's making a donation, whether it's being a volunteer. Uh, there are, we have a page dedicated to all those different opportunities. Um, I did learn that one of the links might not be working. I'll be checking that out today. But either way, you can get right on that web page, take a look, reflect, think. And remember, we're really interested in your giftedness. So Andy has spoken well to it that we couldn't do, do without you. And it's you, you as who you are, the gifts you bring, the gifts that you have to offer, the skills that you bring. So uh, take a look there and consider what might be a creative way you wanna be part of the Hope family. Yes, so yeah. great. Well, it was awesome to be with you all. Andy, thank you so much for stepping forward. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, great, great. And this, this will be posted on YouTube. The link will go out through a newsletter and through social media, but you can always find it on YouTube within a day or two. Okay. Blessings, Perfect. everybody. Blessings. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Love to all. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>